Uh, and then uh, in the back, we have our uh, code enforcement officer and our state officer. Could you guys please introduce yourself and those that you on some issues around the neighborhood? My name is Joel Valaya, I'm a state officer. Uh, if I can be reached at 210 275 2281. If you need something, uh, something hold on to me because uh, I can use my name and I'll just call or text me on the internet. Hi, I'm Anna, I'm a
you know, having a neighborhood association where the same president had been in place for years and years and years um, with no apparent um, vote for any kind of bylaws. So I, I think this is a step in the right direction, but I'm, I'm glad that um, I, I also would be concerned about the issue about the overlapping boundaries. Right. And yeah. um, there, they have some requirements. The requirements that there's like five of them things that they would want to have on record for documentation purposes. The reason why this is a concern is if it, if you if they weren't specific about like whether they wanted files in file, how the format for minutes, and things you know, etc. Like formal requirements. If they had put this forward, that anybody who is registered with the association that by accident or intention didn't meet these requirements and were not be registered with the city, and then everything that we submitted to a council. A committee could not be counted. So um, I just yeah. So that that's a concern. Um, they are wanting neighborhood leadership and feedback on this issue still. Um, they haven't announced any meeting date. So if you have thoughts or comments on it, I'm a relatively rookie neighborhood leader. I just have a really strong history of neighborhood leadership in this community. Um, I strongly encourage you to submit them to the neighborhood housing services department. Um, and since you're like, Yes. Is, is, is this document uh, available for the city? Anymore? Yes. Um, I don't know if it's posted on their website, but I can definitely email it to um, whoever has signed in or anyone else who's interested. Um, I was hoping to pull that up and ask if I would You want a hot spot? Sure, that would be great. Um, so, the other, another thing that would affect us that's going on right now is that. SAWS has a public advisory committee that is reviewing and revising the rate structure. Um, who here is familiar with, okay, so SAWS is our water utility company, basically, um, and periodically they assess and revise rates um, for the city, and uh, they are looking at a way to address affordability in water rates. Um, the affordability-related meetings are coming up in February and March. They are available and open to the public, and there's been very little public attendance at these meetings. So if uh, water breaks or utilities issues are interesting to you, um, Tiro Neighborhood Coalition, among others, is looking very strongly for people to attend and help support and get involved on that. So that is happening. Um, Brackenridge Conservancy is having their annual meeting on January 30th. Um, earlier in 2019, they came to one of our meetings and gave a presentation um, on the assessment that they're doing um, to explore uh, the history of the park, Lincoln World Heritage Site, and some of the bond funding and projects that they're doing. Um, so that's coming up on the meeting, and that does potentially affect us. Um, so, we're moving into carbon sculptures now. The reason why the sculpture debate was very significant um, is because for a long time the city has had a priority of connecting Bracken Ridge Park with the Botanical Gardens using Mickey Park as sort of an obvious in quotation marks connecting point. Um, and so, uh, currently, one of the bond projects that is being worked on from the 2017 to 2022 bond is the Broadway Corridor Project, the effort section of which includes this portion of Broadway between, I can't remember where it starts, basically it goes just <coughs> that's right here. So um, when Place and Trades Foundation proposed this project, it fit in with that priority without costing the city any money. So, and there isn't really, hadn't really been a normal public input process for this sort of project where it's something that affects a taxpayer-funded resource but isn't actually taxpayer-funded. Um, as in, the city is not paying for these art installations. Um, so it's important to us because as a neighborhood, we have high interest in making sure our park remains a natural area but also has some additional amenities, such as a sidewalk where it's not, or benches. Well, that um, makes sense. Yes. And so, um, so the fact that this kind of got pushed yeah, in is, is not just about the sculptures so much as about how the park is used and affects our neighborhood. So um, 
we have the Stroke One sculpture installed. Um, they presented that to the board in June of 2019 prior to their plan <coughs> taking off and trying to get that passed through um, the Public Arts Commission and the city. Um, and it was a similar sort of setup that Catherine Lee, which is supposed to be a temporary lease. And so we had not heard, this was a transition period, we hadn't seen a lot of opposition at that point. And then shortly thereafter, they presented the additional three mural sculptures um, and a plan that we didn't get to be part of. Um, and so at that point, we communicated to the city that we had to be part of creating this plan, we didn't support the whole plan being approved. Um, we had our social media uh, polling done, we had collected feedback um, via email, and then we had our public input meeting. Um, in response to that, um, they were willing to move the sculptures they had initially presented before the plan. They had a public art committee meeting scheduled where those four sculptures were going to be presented, and we compromised and said if you move them outside of the interior of the park, and contact the residents immediately around them and make sure no one who is immediately in front of them is opposed to it, you can install those. We will not approve your whole plan. You need to send us a timeline, a logistical plan, show us that you have the funding to pull them out, um, and give us an advance notice so we can email the neighborhood before they go in and they know what to expect. Uh, they did not meet our <laughs> requests in installing this sculpture, which we have collected information on and are going to use in future discussions with them. Um, I met with Mr. Ponce last night. It's in front of their house. Um, and they appreciate the sculpture, but do not appreciate its exact location, which is not the site that I have actually worked out with them uh, when I met. Um, they contacted me the day before I went to see the site, and then were supposed to give me, um, and the board, not just me, a timeline of when they were going to install it within a week of that meeting and it happened the day before Christmas and they did not get back to me until the day it was installed. And so I did not get to go to the site or check it out and I have been requesting throughout the whole process that they contact the board as a whole, not just me, because people were, <laughs> things happened. Mm -hmm. um, so they haven't kept up their end of the deal. So strategically that will help us in sort of blocking anything um, because the city, Public Arts Commission, and our council person all received the property for our commission statement, which had those requirements which they haven't met, which we've done with you. Um, so moving forward, we want to have a committee for, we have a first meeting in February that doesn't just address the sculptures, but addresses all the things that we want to see in the park. Um, and we have developed a relationship with parks in this way. So if we want to propose a neighborhood plan for the park, we can do so and submit it for the next bond project, which will be 2023 to 2027. So that's sort of where that stands. Um, and because of the nature of this project, and it doesn't, the fact that it doesn't go before a council vote, there aren't really formal public participation guidelines that apply. Why doesn't go before council? Because of the nature of the project. So it's a parks and recreation <laughs> project, um, and the recommendations provided to parks come to the public art committee, which gets, they have public meetings, but they're not published when they are. We have to request them, and Tracy and Tracy can present them. <laughs> Why don't they have to post the meeting? I don't know if they have to or not, they're just not posted. Um, I have been going to some of the other public art project meetings. Um, currently, there's a community rail project on the west side, and they have a schedule, they have three public meetings, they have um, a presentation thing that is part of that. Jimmy Lafleur, who is resident of our neighborhood, is overseeing that process. Um, that is a different kind of project. It is uh, something that is funded partially through tax money and partially um, through a nonprofit that's based on the west side, so it's a different kind of project. Um, but the fact that I've been going shows that we're invested and involved in understanding this, yes. So what are the guidelines for the non-public participation? There aren't really anything that I can tell. I did the public participation guidelines that council voted on, I believe, are for council meetings or for city committee meetings. Charlie, can you Council boards and commissions? Boards and commissions. Boards and commissions, so I mean. So, okay. yeah. It, Basically, it's it's throughout this process, that this is not a project that has a precedent. So, 
they didn't really have a process outlined, and so they, the, the foundation's excuse has been, well, they didn't really know what they were going to do with this project because they're not funding it, so we kind of been making up as we go along. Um, we spent a lot of time for the right. same hop from one park to another park to another park to yes, another park. We're, we're the fourth park. And so, so um, what did they do different than us to stop it? Well, we are residents who it's are park. using oh, the park. Um, oh. and some of the other places that have been, two that, the two that come to me each time are Hamas Fair and Maverick Park. Hamas Fair has a conservancy that is a public private partnership that is a large master plan project. Travis was one that's right in front of it. So, so Travis, I don't know as much about, it, but Maverick Park um, has been a gift <coughs> to some of the developers who are building things on Broadway. And they came together and are going to fund some public amenity projects along the line. So that you have developers who have funding. Um, and, and it's interesting that Trace and Church shouldn't get buy-in from those developers right. for their projects. And I, I wonder if that's because there really isn't a strong need felt for the particular projects that Trace and Trues want to <coughs> give to the public. Do you have the board membership of that too? Yes, they they the only the only copy that we have that completely lists their board members is the handout they gave to the public. I should have it. Oh my goodness, good. So we can but they don't have a website, they don't have a social media page. Um and they they seem sketchy at like this. Is that uh, is that the commission you're talking about for the it is, it's not a commission. It's so it is a private so there's it's a private foundation that is a registered by the one C three. And they have proposed sculpture installations and in secured the acquisition of the sculpture that overseen the installation. In order to do that, they had to get Parks and Rec to sign off on a registry contract. And in addition to that registry contract and the recommendation that was to sign off on that was um, provided by public arts, the Public Arts Committee um, after a presentation made by Trace and Trace Foundation, which is a How old is this uh, Centurious Foundation? I don't know. Have you checked their status on the. I know it's still for the 300 year celebration of San Antonio. Right. And it's still in the house. It's not the Grammy Foundation. So it's Trace Centurions, that's just what they need. It's four years ago, right? So it might be four years old. So the, the only thing that you have is that I start putting a lot of information on it because they are up to date. Like they've done what they need to do in terms of tax filing to stay active um, with the state. So they should have records that guide some of the tenants that you have stayed. Yes. You can, there, but it's not, there's not a lot of information. It's just the basic are they active, are they not? And so we, what we have been able to get so far in terms of a compromise is what they wanted to do with their it's first amendment was have the full plan, which did not be participated in the group. And it did not have any budgetary guidelines, did not have logistical plans, did not have public input guidelines in it and it was not created by with any input from us. Yes. So it's basically a foundation, public private partnership basically, or and to put their artwork in the park. It's not a formal P3 agreement. Okay, but my question would be does that exclude other foundations from doing things? Is that an exclusive well, they, deal? So if what they what has been allowed so far is in a contract between Trace and Trace Foundation and the city is going to include a proposed second parks recreation permit. That is all that's been allowed so far. Which to to view. To, so so the the first four Catherine Lee sculptures that are at the top was the, the first contract, and the Cyril's one and the Greenville Mackenzie sculptures are in addendum, <coughs> and that's all that's been allowed. They wanted to have that addendum be for their whole plan, and it would be exclusively for Trace and Trace and Parks and Rec. That's not to say a different foundation or organization could petition the city to be able to do a similar project. Or another type project, possibly maybe just out of the blue, maybe put a playground or something like that out there. Just, just tossing thoughts out is what I'm saying. 
A gazebo. And like, yeah. go and try to find, go play the dating game with other kind of art, you know, people who are in similar situations to see if you can find a, a better bachelor out there. You know, and then maybe like, try to ask you, well, I mean, this is a terrible metaphor, but I'm just saying, like, if one guy is mistreating you, let's go find one that's treating you a little bit better and see if well, you can yeah, something if, happen. Well, yeah, if we can put in the park, you know, well, I think okay. what, to Corey's point, I think the best that we have shown that they haven't done things in good faith at this point. In our compromise, we include those specific things, expecting some of them not. Why do you feel you're in compromise? I feel you had the the. Oh, well, well, so now they so they have so the way this whole thing started was because <coughs> it, what Trace and Trace had been communicating to the city is that they had actively communicated with the neighborhood. And with the capital lease office, they did communicate with the board. It seemed like a small scale project that nobody was particularly opposed to at the time. Prior they to then, the village, right. Prior to the right. Village. So, and that was apart yes. from this yes. full, full scale right. plan that they have developed. Well, well, let me just answer that question. Right. Yes, they 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 came to the neighborhood association and proposed the the installation at the top of the park, the land use committee <clears> uh, uh, recommended approval, and then the board approved. And all this was before any, anything was done. But they technically did not need the board's approval. They didn't need the board's requirements regarding that particular installation. So they didn't finish up what they had said that they were going to do. It was supposed to be a temporary situation, right? And they didn't like follow through with anything. And so then they came back asking for the dancing flower and the other things. That they well, that's just, well, I mean, it, when, when, and I was on the Latin Community Committee, and I, I was at the meeting with it. And uh, and at that time, that that was a standalone project. Yeah. Uh, everybody on the board thought it was a good idea, uh, and we approved. It. Now, the, does the neighborhood have to approve? No. The, this is a city park. Okay? It belongs to the entire city of San Antonio. All the citizens of San Antonio. Those of us who live on the park uh, get a little bit proprietary about it sometimes when we think it's our park and we've had fights over. Uh, lining in the park, we've had fights over uh, <clears throat> putting uh, a playground or a parking garage or tennis courts in the park. Uh, we, we had a, a huge <coughs> fight over the wildflowers in the park, off the park. But no, the city doesn't have to listen to us. Yeah. Okay, but now, as a matter of courtesy and as a matter of uh, uh, good uh, uh, public administration, they do listen to the neighborhood association, the members. We had a huge fight a few years ago about putting a, a garden in one of the pocket parks. And, and, a, and a very contentious meeting up there. And basically, what, what the city represented told us at that time is that if anybody that lives on that street where that park is objects to this, we're not going to approve it. And somebody did, and so they did. And so that's why it's now on a different piece of property, the community. So, so no, the city, the city does, does not of the neighborhood association any obligation to have any input on this whatsoever. Right, I understand it's that. The same but there should be some kind of a process, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. Right, they follow that. These guys have had their own process instead of just right. making up. The and so, because we on. have, we are, in some sense, a key stakeholder as the and we do understand the importance of agency as we have a strong history of that. That is where when they started snowballing after that initial standalone and a small scale presentation they did, that's what we told the current board pulled the red flag and just said, hey, this doesn't seem right. It's not going to be necessarily all post sculpture could it find a, a path forward that the majority agrees to, but you can't expect this to go well if you don't. Engage the public in this process. Yeah, and, and considering, I, mean, I think this is probably a new thing for the city. No one's yes. ever probably done something like right. this. And so we are, right. you know. It's, it's not technically a public art project by definition because a public art project that's, you know, fun, that's overseen by the public art department of the city. There's actually a parts of the public department um, funds in some way organized to some extent. The commissioning or installation of art, and this is not that. The only question I may have is whether the public art department 
sought this project. Uh, whether this project came to them directly from the centuries or whether it was lobbied to the public art department by people of means or people of power. I feel like it would be more because this is now like the fourth time we've talked about this, going rehashing prior history. And, and although, yes, you know, it's important for people to understand where we've been, I think you've already given a, a good synopsis. And I think it's more important, given this is what's happened, right. what's the next step? So, I so think we can move on. To Cora's point, so. um, our best possible step forward based on what we've seen so far in the documentation that we've gathered is to come together as a community. And this, there is precedent for this now. Dignity Hill did this with Dignity Park. Um, to say these are the things that we think are priorities for the park. We use the park, we're key stakeholders in the park. Um, it may include art, but there are some other things that we value, whether it be the natural environment, whether it be access, whatever. Um, and to work for a group of people from our neighborhood and potentially add others to that, that would be something that would be a separate group committee meeting, to be a consistent advocate for what we want to see in the park. Get funding for anything that we, we do want to have. I think we should include the pocket parts in that. Well, the pocket parts have been mentioned multiple times in the videos. As uh, I think in we'll this for the plan for the park, though, it should be a plan for many parks, parks. Because this one always seems to get singled out. And so we want to send it out there to be in space. The thing is, we're past this part now. Oh, the, the strategy yeah. now is yeah. to yeah. advocate yeah. for what we would like to see in the park or not see in the park, um, and to do it in an organized manner that shows that we do the park that we're engaged in, involved in what we want to see. Well, I know if I ever wanted to leave something to the city, I'd rethink it because it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, that when Mr. Brackenridge donated that park space in the name of his good friend, Mr. Mankey, it was to be an open space, green space for the wildflowers and a place for people to go and not contemplate art or have all this so, stuff. And it becomes a venue. We have liability. What if some of that stuff gets damaged? And that is already concerned. Or hurt. Because kids think that, that dancing flower is not an artwork. They think it's something to climb on. And they already did climb on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one clarification, please yeah. use my ignorance. Uh, is the term pocket parks used to refer to those three triangles? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's also one, Mr. Flores Park, right? Yeah, that was finally accepted as a park. It's not up. Who purchases that? Are they, are they now purchased, purchased, purchased to become a park by the city? I don't know. Those, those, those are, are, uh, I think, created by the earlier developers. Yes. You know, oh, right, they've they always they been there. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, the city became the city. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Another question because it does involve Mankey Park and my property faces it. I came. I come to the meetings about you know how this influences the whole, the whole community, the park, especially as I went to school here. And I was concerned, and there was talk of making a one-way street up Buston and back down one way on Harlem. So now, and I understand people are upset about the infringement of Broadway lots, parking lots, and stuff. Now we have motor cars going up and down. When you have a school on one side, I rent to children. And I certainly don't want them out in the street. And I, you know, it's okay. Usually the garden center, the venues are at night, the big streams of traffic. I don't see a bunch of cars as such. And I'm also just going to throw on the table this world heritage. I, I'm concerned about that too. We own our world heritage, is like, uh, it's not like the United Nations, but something like other people have input other than us, maybe foreigners even. And personally, I, I love it that. the way it is. I don't think there's yeah. any interest in that in the Mankey Park. I don't know if you mentioned it. that's being discussed. It, it's unclear to you whether that's something that's being discussed at the Rockford Park thing. But Lynn Bobbitt did call me to ask if we could go to the meeting on 30th, and she also specifically asked about Arkansas Park, which is why 
I think it's important that we have neighborhood Is that coming up and where is it? January 30th, it's at the Whitney Museum's event room. I believe it starts at 7 o'clock. Oh, so are you yeah. suggesting that we can put it together like a park committee? Yes. Four o'clock at the Whitney Museum. Mm -hmm. It's four o'clock so on the 30th. In the Maze Center. Yeah. Yeah. In the Maze Center at the Whitney Museum. So um, I have not yet had a chance to speak with Lynn on the phone, but the fact that she is aware and interested in Arctic Park is, is a reason that she actually makes sense. Okay. Because if she's interested in it, I don't know what her disposition on information, but because it's housing authority in the city, it's important that we start advocating for what we want to see, because otherwise, well, they're going to do what they want to see. The problem is, they're agreeing on what we want to see. Right. Some people here don't want it strongly. Maybe there's people who live on Funston and Target. I shouldn't say that. There's people who do want it. But I think our concern is a little bigger because this park is different than any, uh, any park that you can go to. You drive to the park, you visit the park, and you drive home. And our instance is technically our, part of our front yard. Mm -hmm. And any involvement uh, that they have with it, bringing in people um, and that such, is affecting the park across from us. Um, of course, that's a little sad. We're looking for volunteers. So yes. I kind of wanted to give an update on since this rule one is there, how it got to be there, and why why it's there, um, and how we're going to move forward. Basically, I think the other thing they're doing is they're going to extremes. They just don't want a few pieces of art art in the park. They want between seventeen and twenty five pieces of art in the park. But in my instance, that's not true. They said they wanted seventeen to twenty five sites. Okay, well, good. And that means you know, that means that so the Catherine Lee is one site. So that could be between where 417 is and 100 pieces of art. What's the reason for That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're not trying to make well, it. Well, are you better? Well, that's what our friend is that. But I think what Taylor is saying is all of us can agree, and I think the, the correct term here in San Antonio is Pluto Federal. I think we all agree that we don't want to have to tolerate any kind of pudo pedo from from um, people coming into our neighborhood. So I think we'd like volunteers for a committee to kind of stand up specifically for our, our garden park and our pocket park. Yes. Hand. I move to create a standing committee for the park. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We don't do this. Yes. <laughs> so no, this is the board. No, the board makes the decision. Right. So this I this is this is what the issue is with the new planning housing services. We may have to start doing that at our meetings. I'd like to suggest that the board create a committee and that perhaps some people would like to volunteer now, but that the board could be So we draw your motion a second so you can make her. <laughs> but it was very dramatic. <laughs> very, like, <laughs> four or five. But it got the ball yeah. to yeah. The state's <laughs> <behind> the very <laughs> procedural. Yeah. That was the type of that we were around for people volunteering. Yes. But I think you ought to pull the original document, document that founded the market. So we did, and all that it stated uh, is that it needs to park it doesn't have to be. I'd like a definition of public park and public space. Well, that's what they were going to discuss with the city, because if your traffic did not specify it in the city, I don't put them on the site. Okay, so that is where that is. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just kind of wrap my head around it. Yes. Is, are there concerns about the, the 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 type of art, or is it concerned about it just being art put in the park? Well, the, 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 I think the largest thing right now, we have all kind of We've been, like, like we've said, we've been through this meeting, we've been through these conversations, the board has, we've talked, we've met with them, we've listened to them, we've read what they had to say. At this point, our largest concern is that we're, we're not enjoying the way that they're doing business. You're not what? We're not enjoying the way that they're doing business. Uh, At this got point, it. The oh, the art, process. The art is got kind it. of been not, it's, it's not even the point at this All right, point. cool. So we just want to make sure that we are putting in place a plan where we can, the art is being doing that are we being respectful? And I kind of like to know where the centurions they get their submissions, and what's the qualification of those artists to be read by them, and then I, I think it's an internal criteria. Um, this text so is under six flags. They are their own jury, and they told us that they meet with the board of 
if, if we uh, oppose it, and then go ahead with it, then we can go to whatever meeting it is, uh, whether it's the zoning commission or the board of adjustment, and oppose it. And sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. So right so, now, but, but this it's, develop, so they have expressed familiarity with the NP and it's in conformance with it. It does look from the design plans like it is a three story structure, which would be in violation of the NP. So, uh, and that's, that's sort of the status on that right now. You know, I, I, I found having dealt with some of the developers and stuff, sometimes if you're opposed and you really don't have any standing to do anything with the city in regards to code and whatever, you still have the opportunity to massage things a tad, okay? And, and sometimes it, it works and it's helpful to perhaps offer up constructive ideas and concepts to these developers because their bottom line is they have a bottom line to deal with. And who better than to offer up legitimate, constructive, you know, I'm not gonna say criticisms, but thoughts to these developers in the neighborhood. And I think at times we tend to forget that we do have a fairly good, pretty good amount of sway in some things if presented the right way. So I wanna be disheartened about what's going on, but I would look to how can you improve what they've got maybe with the exterior or landscaping or whatever. Just the thought there. Which is basically where we are with this. Um, and because not everybody is familiar with, part of this, the point of bringing this up as an exercise is to familiarize more with the neighborhood and how these decisions are made. Um, so, yes, Charlie. You said permeability, and I guess one of the things that comes to mind is, is what's going to happen in terms of um, uh, the coverage of that lot. Yes. And at what point this code did it's not, I don't think it's in our NCD. It's a completely different thing. It would be in some, I think it would be addressed somewhere in UDC. UDC. And, and at what point is it multiple units? Is it acreage? When when do the permeability things kick in? Uh, for Small uh, projects like this, there, there are a number of requirements, okay? You, if you build a big subdivision, then you have to deal with the drainage. But uh, for, for small things like this, there's, there's no drainage requirements. They, they, can, they can build put the pervious cover on as much of that property as is allowed by the front and side yard setback. Except they do have to be concerned about storm runoff. Well, well, any houses are affecting grades on the houses. It, isn't yeah. there something in the state law about if you change the drainage to affect your neighbor that? Yeah, yes, yes, in the constitution. Yes. Yeah, well, okay. It, it, there's, it's a common law concept and it's a statute. Uh, and, okay. and basically, what it says is you cannot affect drainage from the underbuilt uh, <laughs> uh, status of your property so that you damage somebody else's. Property, either by putting more water on it or putting less water on it. Okay. As a practical matter, you know, nobody's ever going to sue anybody else for doing that. Because, it, you know, the first thing you do is you go to an attorney and say, I want to sue this guy. He says, Well, give me a $20,000 retainer. Okay. Okay. I'm an attorney, by the way. But, but so, 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 well, yeah, but, but you know, as, as you know from uh, Imagine homes. They, they built over 50 of those properties, and they and they have some drainage consequences and uh, some other consequences. And um, basically, got a development by buying the property. Right, right, right. So, and because each thing was a one-off, it didn't. Yeah, right. It didn't right. have that's to be right. looked at as a 42 right. unit development. Right. That's right. Um. So. Yeah, again, we're going to move forward with this, but just, you know, that's going on. If you have an opinion about it, we're working with developer and communicate with the city. And part of this is just an exercise to understand sort of how we're doing things in the neighborhood um, so that you know. Um, uh, there has been a series of new hires and staff changes in the District 2 Council office that I will need to make aware of, which is why we have a District 2 rec here recently. Um, our, the person who was assigned to us, who was on the who was that? Uh, 
uh, Jalen and Key Rodriguez. He was me. Yes. So I, yeah, so we have a good design in person. Um, anytime we submitted anything to council or submitted a letter, she's been very supportive and that was not that we don't have someone assigned to us. Um, so that is something that's ongoing that you need to make people aware of. Um, and then 2020 elections are coming up. Um, so if you haven't registered to vote, please do. Uh, local offices that will be, you will have the opportunity to vote for, we will include, but are may not be going to, um, the sheriff's the sheriff. Um, local judges and the county commissioner. Um, the council of mayoral elections will be in 2021, but if you're starting to see signs go up, if you're new to the area, make sure you register. Those are the local offices you'll be voting for. Um, and then stay tuned because the Broadway corridor plan for our section and will at some point be presented. And as I mentioned before, how the park fits into that will be something to be impressed with. So, um, those are some of the big updates that basically have been going on. Um, we do have a sign-up sheet for a park committee, um, but we are interested in reactivating or uh, making better use of committees, making sure that meetings address topics of interest that you all would like to uh, see addressed and that we take on community events or projects of interest to you. So since it's a January meeting, it's the start of the year, we are taking feedback from the floor about things that you would like to see um, for about five minutes because <coughs> Cynthia Cabral from Senator Menendez is also here with updates. So you have five minutes if you just have some idea about something you guys are like, you can always email the board. Um, but if anyone has a topic about the city. You mentioned the saw rates increases yes. in um, most of the time, but when is that meeting? Uh, they, they are, I believe, could you send, I have a question. I want to be emailed too. You know, yes. I mean, I know that this is walk to the door. Yes. Appreciate it, whoever's doing it. Uh, but everybody has an email now, and it seems like you're, I, everybody but me is on social media, I guess. But, um, yeah, you know, we don't shouldn't have any postage costs if, if, if you don't have a walker. But if we could send us more information, because I i don't go to the yes. website, too busy in my business, and I don't do social media. So would you like to see like a monthly or maybe a bi So are some phone numbers and contacts? Like I thought the smoke detector information here, the single family can get a free smoke detector. These are the things that I think the community does, and I always want to drive safely signs on Allensworth where we have so many kids. They would come in and destroy our park with their thoughts, but they don't do things to help our people that live here. And you know, why haven't we had park benches? Okay, I would speak to that because we've been trying I'm to get email. Well, the email. The issue with email has been that we've kept things in spreadsheet format, and I kind of got turned over to when I became the secretary, yes, and I volunteered. I do it. It's a lot more difficult than I thought, and I haven't had time. So we have some new, uh, new blood, some fresh talks, and we can do this maybe a little more. You mean like an email blast? Or yeah, yeah. So well, so we started with yeah. email blasts. And they seem to be yes. The, if you like to do some sort of, I don't know if we could guarantee like a monthly newsletter, but maybe a bi-monthly or maybe even a seasonal. Do you do Facebook? Month? No. Because it could go on Facebook. It could go on next door. It could go. It, it, it is on info at MatthewParks.org, which right. is really easy to find. That's the easiest way to do it and let people seek it out rather than. That's what I'm saying. I don't think they need to keep up with more. Do you agree, make more of an effort to do what we can? But it is really just. We have basically an ongoing sign up list all throughout the year. It's been challenging to make sure that everybody who wants to get added gets added and it is disseminated effectively. And also to identify what people wanted to hear about, um, which is sort of why the updates this way for the January meeting because we really haven't. And there are things that go on all the time, like zoning issues or board adjustment submissions that the board gets notified by their the registered people in the city. But how do you communicate that to the neighborhood and that business to everyone? You know, things like that. We're trying to get a better feel of work. Um, so it's helpful to hear about things like smoke detector, the smoke detector opportunity or, um, you know, if you want to know how you would, what city department you need to call if you were interested in getting those signs installed. Or if you have a dirty issue that you want to report. You know, things like that, if that's what you're interested in hearing about, you just let us know we can kind of start tailoring meetings or information to 
you. Okay, so I, I could probably get to like makingpark.org. Yeah, it's good. I mean, next door, you, know, you put in an email and then they, I mean, then it changes or yeah, I got kicked out or whatever. I could try. It will always be easier for us to post information in one place and have makingpark.org so you don't yeah. have passwords and stuff. Yeah, it's really easy. Yeah, yeah it's it's like that. Park. It's, and you'll find it's going to be But the like the SAWS rating, that affects everyone in the yeah. neighborhood. And I personally call it the SAWS Mahal, and I don't really like the rate increases because I know the projects we're pursuing aren't science. And if it doesn't, it won't be hard. Uh, could you speak to some of the existing committees or committees of yesteryear? So <laughs> it's a combo right now of things we would like to see and things that have been in the past. Uh, land use is the most active. Um, a lot of the current members are long-term residents in George. I would really to speak to this more. Um, but there are who recommends to the board uh, based on their expertise and their working with building and board adjustment um, issues, whether or not something conforms to the NPD, um, reasons to support or oppose, and we are picking different ways. We don't oppose it because we don't have an objection to, to things that go in, but they review land issues um, for us and make recommendations to the board. Um, we are interested in having the park committee, which we have assigned it for. Um, we also would like to do a welcoming committee, so that <coughs> all of the people who come to meetings for the first time or neighbors who can't attend meetings, um, who may be new to the neighborhood to make sure they get welcomed. Um, we have a presidential committee that a uh, former board member Morgan McKenna can take care of that if we get submissions about any issues, specifics about neighbors, questions about the NCD, anything, um, we have someone who can answer more quickly and more quickly. Because they, there is no funding for the 
the they're going to remove it and give it to transit. Yeah, yeah. But this is, you know, this is off the business. The removal of money from the optical fund is nothing for the So we can, this, we can make that our February meeting topic and also send out some information about that if that would be of interest. How much money do we have in our bank account after the um, stage? Okay. Yeah. 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 So in this newsletter, um, you'll see on, I think it's on page 9 and 10, it's the last couple of pages, um, we're asking people to give us some feedback as to what it is that they'd like to see uh, Senator Benedict address when he's, at, when he's at the legislature, that's page 5, let's see, and 6, pages 5 and 6. So on those pages, if you, if you want to just submit um, things that you are concerned with, things that you'd like to see him address, uh, laws that you'd like to see him pass, um, you can submit that on those pages. And then turn it into us. You can either mail it or you can email it to me, um, or you can come by the office, which we love to see visitors come by the office with us. So, and where is that again? Our office is at, um, what is it called? Wonderland of the Americas. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that was Crossroads, Wonder, Wonderland, Crossroads, Wonderland of the Americas. Uh, <laughs> I said does everyone have a business card? Or would y'all like, does anyone not have a business card? No, I'll take one. Just okay. Get the ball rolling. Yeah. <laughs> so I am Cynthia, but of course, as soon as you walk in, I don't know. I guess you don't have. Any. As soon as you walk in, um, anyone that's in the office at the time can help you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um. 
So we're all at the same card, and hi, I'm Cynthia. Everybody, I know that a lot of you are familiar with the staff. Um, a lot of you have been working with us for a while. So anyone else need a card? Okay. All right. So um, if y'all want to do um, submit that, you're welcome to do that. If y'all have any questions about that, y'all can always call us as well. Um, I wanted to also mention that I don't know if any of y'all knew, but this past Saturday we had a, a, a law clinic. Um, basically, we opened up, we worked with, a, with an organization here in San Antonio, it's called, um, it was a People's Law School, but this one was, um, uh, gosh, I don't have the name of it, but it's, a, it's an organization, it's a, it's a group of college students um, at UTSA and St. Mary's, and they basically are working with different lawyers here in San Antonio on giving free legal advice to people who can't afford lo uh, lawyers. So we have that, it's a great service that they're doing. We basically opened it up this Saturday to our constituents to come and talk to, it's, we had it set up with a, where uh, we had groups of them, I think Jeff Davis and a whole bunch of others were there, just a bunch of them. And they basically sat in different areas of the room and had people come and talk to them about what they need help with. And then when they're gonna carry that over to so that these particular lawyers can help them with that at, at no cost. That's really cool. That is cool. So um, uh, it turns out it was a hit. We were kind of worried it was the first time we had done it. Um, so it was, it was kind of a hit. So we're going to see if we're going to do it again. I don't know if we can. I mean, it's kind of hard to ask them to donate their time and, and all. Can you arrange for them to get some sort of credit? We do, like yeah. Or, you, know. you know, they do get certain credit from the courts. But um, well, it's, it's, it's the school if they're still in school, too. Oh, the students. Yes, they do get credit. Well, I thought you were talking about the lawyers. Get the well, I know. Well, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, the students do get credit for it, depending on what their degree is and who the professors are or that are involved. So, yeah, that's, that, that's another opportunity for them. So, um, <coughs> I guess piggybacking on that, we're actually going to be uh, partnering. We're not, we're not a part of it, we're partnering and helping spread the word um, with St. Mary's University School of Law. They're going to be holding their own event, and it's going to be on Saturday, February 15th. Um, that one is going to be at the School of Law, which is at, uh, there on, um, uh, I don't know where that is, it's on North West 36th Street off St. Mary, off in Bison. St. Mary's, I'm sorry, I just had some, something done in my tooth. Like, I'm to talk about so, um, anyway, uh, and their method, what they're doing is doing breakout sessions. So in the breakout sessions, they're covering certain topics, like different tutorials about the topic. So this is basically, this is the way they're going to be breaking out. I can hand these out to for y'all or for y'all to give to people that you think might be interested. I'll leave them up here okay. if y'all don't mind, or I'll leave them right here actually. Okay. There's yeah. one right now. Okay. So if y'all want to attend, those are they're there, or you can pass them along. How about your elder fraud documentary? So we're gonna be doing that again too. Thank you for asking about that. Um with that one that that support two, we're gonna be doing on uh, in March. And uh, Charlotte was nice enough to do that to, to film it for us. It's on um if y'all want to see the video of that, it's on our website, and I believe it's on y'all's website, um, which is the full half hour that we did it. It was actually it's more than that, but but um, but the, the really cool thing is that we went, I went through it line by line, so you can just jump to the part that you're interested in. So you wow. don't have to watch the whole two hours. You, if you pull up the story, you can you can go to where you can get help doing the. Um, Living will and mm -hmm. all the really, it was such important stuff. It was really, really great research. Yeah, it so it was advanced directives and anything, um, everything dealing with, with the elder abuse. Uh, we had different dignitaries there, as y'all know. We will be doing another one, I believe, in March. So, um, luckily, thank goodness, the senator did not get an opponent for the election. So, we have yeah, we can concentrate on, on the constituents and putting the events together. So, we haven't dug in on a, how what the planning is yet. We're kind of taking everything um, um, project by project, but that one is definitely coming up in, uh, in spring. So um, yeah, that was that was really awesome. But if y'all want to see a video of it, of course, we thanks to Charlotte, we've got it on our website and we've got it on her website, and we'll be doing another one. I'll, I'll come back and do it with y'all prior to that. Um, meanwhile, we've got on Wednesday, February 12th, we're holding Senator uh, Fernandez is holding his senior sweetheart dance. Um, everyone's welcome. It's free. Um, in fact, people actually look forward to this a lot. They dress up, but they wear, they bring their dates, or they bring their husbands, they bring their kids. And um, they do dancing, we've got food, we've got um, it's just entertainment. Uh, this is going to be the Lucky Bar. Where's that? It's on Callahan. It's close to, it's close to our office. Yeah. <laughs> so th this, it's from 10 to 1, so it's in the middle of the day. 
Um, it's fun. <laughs> I was like, who's, who's gonna go? But the thing is, people, we get people standing outside people and waiting to get in, and they're dressed up, and they're we have the photographer, so it's really cool. But anyway, um, y'all are welcome to come. You're welcome to bring anyone y'all would like. Um, your parents, your your siblings. I don't really think we'll do it. I'll leave the flyers up here for y'all. Also. <laughs> Okay, and then she. I know. She so, um, last year, obviously, we made KPFD Thursday. Just uh, real quick, it's uh, on Thursday. The city of San Antonio is doing what's called the Point in Time Count. We do it every year. What we do is we go throughout the whole city and we count homeless and, and uh, we try to get uh, federal money to, to assist them. So, if you know of any locations uh, that in this area or any area, and you forward them to me, uh, either by text or email. Um, my email is jz518 at hotmail.com. It's jz518 at hotmail.com. I'm sorry, that's my personal. That's, that's wrong. Thank you. Um, <laughs> 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 but it's J O E L. Hotmail. 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 We appreciate that information so that we can um, do the count and have an accurate count so that we can assist the homeowners. Yeah, I have four on that. I mean, I have a question about the homeless. Let's start out the homeless population. Is San Antonio experiencing the camps like other southwestern cities in the United States? I don't, I don't believe we are. I, I've been on vacation to like you know different cities in the past couple of years. I'm sorry. Yeah, we just cleaned that one. Well, there's one on Main and 35. We we, we get people uh, from other cities that think that you know we're pretty aggressive as far as trying to help. Um, that's the number one goal. We try to get them a place to go. Um, but also, on, you know, besides that, you know, we get a lot of complaints about the homeless that are there and, and the safety of, of the homeless being there. So it's kind of twofold that we we attack it and we stay on top of it. Um, compared to other cities that I've seen, um, we do have to give them notice. I think it's 72 hour notice. Uh, when we see a camp or people setting up tents, we give them notice um, that, you know, we all work well for services. We take the uh, tent ministries and we also take Haven for Hope and we offer them everything that they can imagine that they would need. And most of them say no, but then we say, okay, um, we, we're offering the help. Here's the numbers, here's the information, everything else. We're going to be back in 72 hours, and we're going to remove everything from here. So we've been pretty uh, done pretty well with that, and they have moved. Uh, we had a big camp in River Road along the river, and uh, they had alerted me to it. I went to visit it, and there were nobody there that we found. But I, I, I went back several days after, and I didn't look my car, but they started clearing out because I think they'd seen me go in, in and out. So we don't we're not seeing the problems that other cities are seeing. But we're seeing more volume, it seems like. So, you know, but, but we're pretty good about trying to get us somewhere. Yes, ma'am. This is probably a silly question. I just, I just didn't know what to do at the time. But um, maybe two weekends ago, in our park by the fountain, there seemed to have been like a small camp that had just kind of been abandoned and all the stuff was left okay. by the fountain. And it was there for a few days, actually. Okay. And I <coughs> Yeah. My husband went kind of, you know, poked around and said there, there was no one there, but I was just concerned. Like, is that a three one one call for the for the stuff that's left out? Or? Either three one one or let me know, and I'll I'll get with three one one also. But we we get with uh, TCI Traffic and Capital Improvements, and they have cleanup crews that'll come out pretty quickly. Especially if stuff's abandoned, you know, we don't want to leave trash abandoned, you know. But but if it's a camp where there's like tents and property, sleeping bags and a suit yeah, clothing. just it's a 311 call. Yeah, well, someone sleeps under the fountain on the back between the bushes because it's a little cover. Okay, so they don't need a tent. Yeah, it's a, it's a wide it's, cover. Yeah, if you see it, let me know and I'll address it and I'll take care of it. Okay, so there's a, currently a truck that periodically. Yeah, I'll put the name of their truck. Yeah. Um, okay. They're actually um, friends with the property owner on Eleanor. 
So we're trying to get them third eye. I believe he came back. And yeah, he was there and it's not good. He's back. Yeah, he's back. I saw him on Ira this morning. Um, he did have all the debris on his truck. Um, normally he dumps it on Ira, but I didn't see anything that he left behind. Yeah, he had his like, <coughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. He, I'm sure he's been offered for his own Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Long, and there's a couple of his plant days. And see, people like that, you know, we're, number one, like, the goal, like I said, is we have, uh, you know, the same trucks that we work with and try to get them into housing. Mm -hmm. That way, they're, they're trying, but they need a little bit of assistance to get to that point, so we're, we're just trying to help them. Yes, sir. Got yeah, two questions. What day is your roundup? You it's the, what are they, 21st, 23rd, <coughs> um, and it's a morning now. We're going to be out, like, bright-eyed, which at like, 4 a.m., I believe it's when our first crews go out and start counting. And this is under all the bridges. This is under, uh, <coughs> like a lot of overpasses have a lot of homes. You would be amazed at how many homes are under the bridges, especially at San Pedro and like where the drive stream is. We're, we're in a process, we're gonna do a count first, but after we do the count, we're gonna in the process of, of putting fencing around there so that they can't go back because they're, they go back quite a bit and then they hook up to electricity. They'll tear up wires and hook up and, it's, it's crazy that the, the, the length that they go um, to, to get electricity and stuff like that. But if we're doing the morning, and then we're, we're coming in late. We're probably working until about 1, 2 in the morning uh, Thursday night. So it's an all-day affair. Um, so that's when we're doing it Thursday. Good. The other question we had, and it came from one someone by email, there's a question about mental health Thank you. issues mm -hmm. and, uh, and what the city has to offer in that regard. As far as the mental health, I mean, we do have, uh, with the police department, I can't really answer for the city, but with the police department itself, we do have a mental health unit that has grown, I think it's doubled and tripled in size from its inception. We used to have two officers for the whole city. Now I believe we have 24-hour coverage that are two officers per shift. Um, for the whole city, though, but, but they offer <coughs> for, for chronic type mental health issues, right. um, they address them, and, and they have, um, clinicians that work with the city now that can, um, you know, administer medication, stuff like that to different people. They don't have to be um, ED per se. They can, the clinician go over there and maybe administer some medication for them if they need it. So There was an excellent article, I think, last year and maybe the Sunday paper on that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, like, I get, we get phone calls all the time. There's like, uh, I think it was San Francisco PD uh, lieutenant from them had called and wanted information on their mental health unit because they're kind of lagging a little bit, but um, they wanted information. I gave the number to her and she said she would call and get some more information. So we're, we're kind of leading the way um, for that, but I mean, there's always room for improvement. So, yes. Am I correct in thinking that the more information the police department gets about specific individuals, the better off that individual will be to get help? Yes. So, yes. Like, so for instance, the other night there was a man reenacting what I think might have been Paul Revere's ride. Okay. Um, did he have a horse? He thought he did. Did he have a horse? He thought he did. He was doing a whole oh, voice and he then stood in the middle of the brothels and had kind of a little concert situation. And then, so I called. And it wasn't that I felt like he was endangering anybody. I just wanted. I, I just thought that the more of a track record these individuals have, the more likely they are to be getting help. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the more we learn about people, um, the more that we're able to help them. If, and if you if you allow that person to kind, of, they're they're in crisis, right? If you allow them to stay that way, um, nobody calls on them. They, they'll n normally get worse, and they'll self medicate with medication or narcotics. So if we can catch them and and, and we talk to them, and if we feel like they're either dangerous themselves. See, it used to be we'd only emergency detain somebody if they were dangerous themselves, you know, or they're, they're uh, suicidal or homicidal, danger to others, right? And that was pretty much it. Now, if, if they have, we consider mentally decompensated, um, whether it's shower issues or, or what, they're, what they're thinking or, or, you know, all their thoughts, we can, we can eat them based on that. So it's a lot less that we need to, to emergency detain somebody. But uh, most officers have been trained in the academy, and every year we go back to, for additional training on how to deal with mental health, and we do see a lot of that. So definitely, yeah, we call on it, and so that we can be aware and, and, and try and give them the help they need. So. Yes. All right, I thank you all very much. All right. Yes.
um, before she left, the Senator Stepper said she he would like to come and visit with the Native Friends Association if we would send back a, a signal about when. And and one more thing to add to you, what you can do to help the school and to homeless people with this really easy lift. You saw that coat rack in the lobby. Yeah. That's there for kids, and and they take donations. Also, Central Library and <clears throat> the one out next to the um, food bank both have um, racks in the middle where you can leave a coat for somebody because the library is actually a, a daytime place for a lot of um, people who spend their evenings um, homeless. So. Hmm. Um, I don't think they coordinated an official daytime beverage this evening, but if you are interested in going, some of us will be here. I've been up town and moved back in just here this last month or two. If we're having issues with the mansions coming in and you know, cowering over us or neighbors that are or investors that are not playing necessarily fair in the neighborhood, is there somebody here at the association that we can talk to? Um, the best thing to do to start is to send in your concern or issue to the board <coughs> at info at lakeparks.org. Um, we have someone who is the chair of the concerns committee, president for a while now, so it's, it can either start by entering the community, you know, a lot of the developer issues and the preparation that they do to put you know, people, point you in that direction. Some things we can address, some things we can't, so we can just speak up and be like, hey, see what we can get. But Do they tend to come to the meetings? The developers? Yeah. Uh, very rare. Very rare. Very rare. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.